In this video, I will be talking about the basics of validity and reliability as they relate to measures. So a few learning objectives first, I'll define what those terms mean, and we'll be talking about them specifically in the context of survey research for public health purposes. Um, I'll also describe how to interpret validity and reliability estimates from studies that are designed to look at how good a measure is, talk about how to write questions that make it more likely to be a valid measure, and finally, we'll briefly look at PubMed to find studies that assess validity and re reliability of a measure. So first, let's talk about the big picture here. So why do we care about validity and reliability? Uh, and really, the answer is, as we've talked about already, surveillance is a critical component of public health. So in order to understand the epidemiology of any health condition, we typically start with descriptive epidemiology, so who's impacted, where do they live? What have the trends been over time? And in order to do that, we need to have good measures of health experiences, health outcomes, health status. And so I think of there being three major components in survey research. One is the questions themselves, and that's what we'll be focusing on today. You also need to think about who is included in your sample. So you wanna have validity in terms of your sampling procedures. And then the data collection process itself needs to be valid and reliable. So there are important aspects of all three of these, but again, today we're just gonna be focusing on the questions. How do you develop a question that accurately and reliably measures a health-related issue? So let's talk about that. Let's, we'll start with validity, and validity is really getting at the truth. So you wanna know, does someone have a particular health condition or not? Were they exposed to something that might impact their health or not? Do they experience things in their daily lives that influence their health? So lots of different types of validity. Uh, I will talk through them here, but it's not so critical that you know the specifics of this right now, but just to give you a sense of what are we talking about when we think about validity as it relates to questions. First is face validity. So this is just kind of a gut check of, does it seem like the measure is actually measuring what it's supposed to? Um, you know, so if we're asking about, let's say we're just trying to measure smoking, uh, we might think about, well, what, how do we define smoking? So uh, in terms of face validity, does the question describe what counts as a tobacco product? Is it just cigarettes or is it pipes and um, other forms of tobacco as well? We also might want to think about the frequency with which someone uses tobacco, the quantity each time. So all of these might be important aspects of the measure. So face validity is just looking at, does it seem to be measuring smoking? Construct validity has to do with whether, whether a question measures just one dimension or attribute. So generally, and we'll come back to this later when we talk about good practices, you only want to measure one thing at a time, so you don't want to lump a bunch of things together that kind of muddies your instrument. So construct validity, when we're looking for evidence of it in a paper, for example, we might look at information about theory, um, and sometimes factor analysis or item response theory are the statistical methods or the approaches that are used to develop construct validity. So for example, uh, quality of life has many different constructs within it. It's a broad concept with different constructs within it. And so when you're thinking about measuring quality of life, you might want to focus on just health-related quality of life. And so you'd want to do some work to make sure that the questions are just getting at the health-related aspects of quality of life and not things like um, life satisfaction or more um, unrelated topics. And then criterion validity, criterion related validity is the third, time, third type I'll talk about today. And that just means, does our measure match up with an existing measure that's already known to be valid? So if there's already a good measure of tobacco use or smoking out there, and we wanna develop a new one, we'd wanna do kind of a head-to-head -head comparison and see, does our measure match up? So that's criterion. You have some existing criterion, some, some existing, um, measure that we know works and do we get the same results? The same thing could be done with quality of life. There are other, quality of life is related to other concepts. And so there might be a different, met, you know, something that's di measuring a different construct than quality of life, uh, but you'd still, you'd expect them to be related in a positive way. And so that could be used to provide evidence of criterion related validity. We'll go through an example in class, so this will make a little bit more sense later if it's not completely clear now. 
just a side note, this is when I'm talking about validity in this context, again, it's related to questions. So we're not talking about the general internal and external validity. In other words, is our study applicable to other populations or within itself, is there internal validity? We're just talking about the questions. So next is reliability and reliability gets at consistency or repeatability. So if you deliver the same measure to the same people at different time points, you would expect to get the same answer. And so that's the, the general concept of reliability. There are, again, different ways that we can measure this, different ways people might look at it within particular studies. Uh, the first is internal consistency. So that's if uh, I have a, a long scale, maybe it's not just one question, maybe it's 12 or 15 questions to measure a particular construct. Again, smoking behavior or quality of life. Typically, it's more than one item. Uh, so we'd expect that certain items across those measures would line up with each other. So that's internal consistency, that my responses to items that get at similar concepts should be similar. Test retest reliability is more at different time points, kind of the example I gave initially. So if I, if I surveyed you today about your quality of life, and again tomorrow, and again in a week, quality of life doesn't usually change very quickly. So those we would expect that those responses would all be pretty highly correlated with each other. It shouldn't matter too much which day of the week in a short period of time you give someone a survey most of the time. Um, so you'd expect to see similarity between those. There are, of course, exceptions to that. There are times where maybe with smoking behavior, for example, if someone does only smoke in social settings or on the weekends, then you might see some differences across days. So it's important to think about the, the time frames that you're using. Uh, but generally, for most measures, there is some time in which we would expect to see the same general level of, of an experience uh, if we answer if we ask people a question, the same questions. Now, intra-rater and inter-rater reliability have to do with the person doing the measuring. So for example, if we weren't doing a self-administered survey, if instead we had an interviewer asking the questions or even somebody observing, maybe we weren't even asking people questions, we're just observing their behaviors, we still want those measures to be similar at different time points. So intra-rater means within the same person. So if I'm doing the measuring of someone else's smoking behavior, uh, you would expect that if I did it today and if I did the observations tomorrow, those two should be similar to each other, assuming that person's behavior pattern was, was stable, consistent. And then inter-rater reliability is where if we have multiple people, so let's say it's not just me doing the observations, there are 20 different people doing observations all over campus, you want to make sure that all of us, if we're trained the same way and have the same measurement instrument, we should all be getting the same answers in the same situation. And so inter-rater reliability typically is tested uh, by having multiple people who are part of the study team collect data at the same time point and then compare the responses for those different raters to make sure they all match up with each other. So again, for, for both validity and for reliability, you probably won't see every one of these dimensions addressed in any particular evaluation of a measure. But these are just the different kinds of things you can do to establish that your measure is valid and or reliable. And I like this visual image of, of validity and reliability because again, they're, we typically assess them together. And so on the left hand, bull, so we have the bullseye here. So if you imagine the, the center, the bullseye part itself, the red, red center is the truth. So that's what we're trying to get our measure to capture is the truth. And the first example on the left is showing you something that's reliable. So all the little points, the blue dots here, those are our measurement measurements at different time points. It's a reliable measure, so they're all similar to each other. They're kind of clustered together, but it's not a valid measure. It's not close to the truth. They're not clustered around the truth. So that's not a good measure. We, it's good that it's reliable, but we also need it to be valid. The second one is valid in that on average, these blue dots would kind of, uh, you know, again, if we, if we took the average of them, it would land somewhere around the red dot, but they are scattered so widely, there's so much error in them that they're not reliable. So that also is not a good situation. If we did 
we use this measure to do statistical tests, we probably wouldn't be able to see any differences because there's so much variation in our data. It would give us really wide confidence intervals, which means we probably wouldn't find any uh, statistically significant uh, differences between groups. The next one here, the third one from the left is neither. So this is probably the arguably the worst situation. Uh, so the average would not, the average of all these blue dots would be centered somewhere up here. So not close to the truth, not valid. And they also are not reliable. So there, they, there is wide variation between them. So again, we have the problem of, of having uncertainty in our measure. But the last one is what we're looking for. So reliable, the blue dots are all clustered near each other. We'd have pretty high confidence that we had our answer. And it's also valid. They are clustered around the truth, around the center of this measure. So that's what we're looking for when we talk about valid and reliable measurements. Now, I'm not gonna go into all the different types of measures for each of those different aspects of validity and reliability, but I will just somewhat overly simplify to say that all of the measures that you'll see reported are essentially a measure of correlation or an adjusted measure of that. Um, so most of the time you'll see a value, whether it's a kappa or an alpha value, or it says a correlation value, a lowercase r, they're essentially representing a correlation, meaning that zero means there's no agreement between the two measures, and one means they're perfect agreement. So it'll be somewhere in that zero to one range. And so the higher, the better is basically the rule. So this table at the bottom shows the way that I interpret it. Some people have a little bit more generous interpretation, but usually if I see that somebody has a correlation value between either their measure and the criterion measure or their measure at two different time points, so whether it's validity or reliability, if I see a, a value of 0.8 or higher, I think that's, that's good evidence. It's a good agreement. It's a strong association between the two measures. And then it kind of goes down from there. Um, anything below 0.4 is very weak. And so even if it's statistically significant, I'm usually not very impressed because it doesn't matter so much to me if it, there's a statistically significant difference. If there's not a strong association, then it's not evidence of a very good measure. So in other words, again, higher numbers, numbers closer to one, mean there's a better measurement property. There's a stronger association between whatever is being measured. So some tips for writing a good question. I should stop here and say, it's always best to use an existing measure and you wanna make sure you choose one that is valid and reliable. But there are instances where we wanna ask about a topic or a concept that doesn't have an established measure. And so if you do write your own question, make sure you only include one construct at a time, ask about one thing at a time, don't combine you know, type and frequency of smoking, for example, into a single question. You want to separate those out. Be clear and direct. And just like we talked about with every other kind of writing, you want to write at as low a grade level as possible so everyone can understand what we're trying to ask about. You also want to make sure it's not just the question, but the response options are important too. So people, just by nature, we tend to give an answer that feels like it's kind of in the middle. So if you give a people a very narrow range, let's say again for smoking, if you say, you know, how many cigarettes do you typically smoke in a day and your choices are zero, one, five, and 10, people who smoke a pack a day or more are gonna be, um, or let's say the last one was 10 or more, everyone's gonna be clustered in that 10 or more category in truth. So that's not very helpful to you to analyze the data. But also some people might feel like, oh, if 10 or more is the highest and I'm in that category, maybe I should just say five because I don't, I don't wanna be at the high end of this. So you wanna make sure that people see their experiences reflected in your data so you're not inadvertently skewing your data. Um, and again, you also wanna capture the actual range so that when you do analyses, you don't have very few observations in one group and a whole bunch in another group that it's kind of large and undefined. You certainly don't want to lead respondents, so that sort of relates to the response options, but if you're doing an interview, for example, you don't want to say, you never want your interviewers to say something like, you don't do this, right? Because clearly that's giving the respondent the expectation that 
it's a bad thing. We don't want them to do that thing. So just ask questions in, a, in an objective manner. And also think about the order of your questions. So as you're putting together a large survey, we typically start with easier questions, by which I mean things that people don't have to think too hard to answer, you know, the, the number of times or the last time they did something that'll require a little bit of recall. Um, so asking them to maybe rate their current feelings or experiences can be a little bit easier. And we also typically put the demographic somewhere in the middle or the end. So give people a chance to feel comfortable with you before they start giving you a lot of personal details. So how do we find evidence about validity and reliability of particular measures? My preferred search engine for articles is PubMed. So I'm gonna show you how to do it in PubMed. There are of course corollaries for other kinds of um, other uh, search engines, sorry. But let's use PubMed. And so to do this in PubMed, you just go to the website. Let's say we wanna look for tobacco use since that was the example I gave before. So you can type tobacco use in the search box on the main landing page and click search. And this will give you all the studies about tobacco use. And in order to narrow it down to the ones that focus on validity and reliability, um, under the article type, you wanna select validation studies. So it's probably not gonna be a default option. So we'll have to click this additional filters box first and then choose it. But if we do that, it's on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, so here are the, well, it's already on mine because I've used it before, but under article type, by default, it usually ends at systematic review. And so to get it to show the validation study, you click additional filters and then scroll down here and check this box. It'll probably be unchecked for you. And then once it shows up, you may need to actually select it again here so that it limits the results to validation studies. So all of these articles, um, you can see here, this is the effect of proxy responses on tobacco use. The first one is developing and validating a virtual agent to screen for tobacco and alcohol use disorders. So all of them should be studies that aren't just looking at, you know, is smoking use associated with birth outcomes or with employment history or, or any other factor. It's just saying, how do we accurately measure tobacco use in populations? And so all of these studies should be focusing on tobacco use or some aspect of it. You know, this one here is about beliefs. This one's change in smoking. So there are lots of different ways to measure it. And, and it, depending on your particular interest, you would wanna choose the best fit. And we will also be talking about how to evaluate measures. So, um, and, and reading these articles can be a little bit challenging because they're different than traditional research articles looking at is an exposure related to an outcome. So we'll do this example in class, but the, the short overview is usually the introduction or the methods of one of these validation study articles will tell you what the tool is, why, why the authors were designing it, what, what their interest was. And then the methods is probably going to be the place where you can find information about the relationship between the measure and the theory. So if you're looking at that kind of construct validity, it's probably going to be in the methods. And then the actual results of whatever they found as it relates to the validity and reliability of their measure is going to be in the results section of the article. So that's where you'll see the correlation value that they calculated. So that's where you can look to find is it point eight or 0.7 or 0.6, how strong is the evidence for this measure? And then you'll have to make a decision about whether you think it's a good measure or not. And so you can put all this together. The discussion section of the paper will probably have the author's opinion about whether they think it's a valuable measure. Um, but that's where really where the, your critical assessment will come in. And there's a document on the class website that walks through one example, the enriched social support measure. And so we'll do that together in class as well, but go ahead and take a look at that just to start, start to get familiar with what, how to do this process because you'll be doing it for an assignment in the future.